Well, I want to thank you for inviting me to the American University of Kosovo. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I made this video because after the Nobel Prize was announced, my office in Houston was getting lots of phone calls from all of the local colleges, and high schools, and even the middle schools to come and talk to young people. And I did quite a bit of that. I talked at the mosque, I talked at the churches, colleges, etc. But the requests were overwhelming, more than I could handle with my schedule, because I had other things to do as well. So I decided to make this video, and I assembled a team of people <coughs> in the Texas Medical Center, which is the largest medical center in the world. Uh, and in the medical center, they have a television educational program at MD Anderson Hospital, probably the best cancer hospital in the world. And we got together and talked about making this video, and they got very excited about it. We planned uh, for several months as to how we would do this. And I thought we needed a group of young people and I really directed initially the video to young high school students, 12, 13, 14 years old, to get them excited about science. Uh, but I've shown this video now. I mean, that was done in my family room in my house. It took a few months of preparation. Uh, they auditioned students around the high schools to find some of the brightest young students who were actors and participating in plays in the schools. And we did this one morning for several hours, and I enjoyed it. <coughs> and I've shown it now to lots of people. I sent copies to my grandchildren. The youngest at the time was four years old. And he got into it, and he played it over and over and over again. He played it so many times, he memorized all the lines. And one day, one of his friends came over, and he showed him the video. And he must have shown it to him many, many times. And his friend said, my goodness, don't you have videos without your grandfather? <laughs> but on another occasion, I was giving a lecture at a breakfast club. It was like a rotary club, business people, retired people, engineers, oil engineers, businessmen, bankers. They were in their 70s and even 80s. And I was there to talk to them and tell them something about what I did. And I wanted to show them a video about the institute that I was directed, what research was going on. But the video, the tape was defective and it didn't work. And I thought, what do I do now? So I went to my briefcase and I pulled out this children's video. I thought, I'm going to show them a children's video, and I did. And they really enjoyed it. And I think they enjoyed it because it's lay language. I say it's soft science. Uh, people can understand it between the ages of four and in that room were people in their 80s. So this video has been shown all over the world. It's on the internet. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it on the Nobel Electronic Museum. So if you want to show it to your friends, colleagues, children, grandchildren, uh, it's available, widely available. Uh, and it was fun to do. <clears throat> uh, I became interested in cell communication as a medical student, graduate student, when I went to Cleveland in 1958. The chairman of the department was Earl Sutherland, my mentor, and his colleague Ted Rawl, who was helping direct his laboratory. And the year before I joined them, they had discovered cyclic AMP, cyclic adenosine monophosphate. And that turned out to be the first intracellular second messenger, and I'll tell you what that means in a moment. And for that work, in 1971, <coughs> Earl Sutherland got the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. So I was very fortunate to enter this field of cell communication regulation very early as a student. And the next 10 years were exciting years to see how this molecule mediated the effects of so many hormones and so many drugs. Very, very exciting time. But then, uh, as I moved from my training in Boston and at NIH, I went to Virginia for a, I joined the faculty in 1970. And I thought that I might switch to another field. 
because the cyclic AMP field was getting rather crowded. There were lots of scientists attracted to this now because of the Nobel Prize. <clears throat> and about this time, another messenger molecule, potential messenger, evolved from the work in several other laboratories. And some of us thought that it too might be important to mediate the effects of hormones and drugs. And I then decided to switch my interest from cyclic AMP to cyclic guanosine monophosphate. <clears throat> Cyclic GMP is a cousin of cyclic AMP. It's a nucleotide. It varies in structure by basically an amino acid on a purine ring. And I did have a significant background in chemistry in college as well as biology. And I switched to get involved with this field. And I thought that this new molecule, cyclic GMP, might also mediate the effects of hormones and drugs. <coughs> And wouldn't it be interesting to figure that out? So I switched fields. And again, as serendipity would have it, and having been, I guess, in the right place with the right people at the right time, it turned out to be a very important field. I thought it was going to be important, but I didn't recognize how important it would become. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that story shortly. But if we could have the first slide to introduce the concept. And I'm going to skip some of the biochemistry detail. And what I want to do is give you an overview of some summaries and the excitement that I still have about this whole field and where I think it's going to go in the future in medicine. Today, there are probably 60 or 70 biotech companies all over the world interested in nitric oxide and cyclogen. That's the potential that it has. And at the end, I will show you a list of diseases and processes where it works, and how a lot of new exciting drugs in the next 5 or 10 or 15 years will come from this research. So if we could have the first slide. Okay. <coughs> this is the concept of cell communication. I call it cell signaling. How do cells talk to each other? The first person to come up with any evidence that cells communicated was Pavlov. Pavlov was a St. Petersburg, Russia physiologist and doctor. He knew about the work of a scientist in Michigan, United States, who had a gunshot wound. It was an accidental hunting accident to his abdomen. And he developed what we call a fistula, a communication between the stomach and the exterior. And his gastric secretions would drain out of this fistula. And he thought that might be an interesting physiology model to study. So he looked at his patients and noticed that when they would smell food or see food, they enhanced their gastric secretions out of this fistula, out of this drain coming out of the stomach. And that prompted him to develop similar models in dogs. And those who have had training in psychiatry and psychology know about the Pavlovian dog experiments. He created pouches and fistulas in dogs. He would show these dogs food or let them smell it. And sure enough, they too enhanced their gastric secretion. He realized from his experiments that the brain was talking to the stomach the senses were communicating somehow with the stomach to regulate gastrointestinal physiology. Pavlov received for that work understanding gastrointestinal physiology in 1904, three years after the Nobel Prizes were created. And that's another story. The prizes were created because of the fortune that Alfred Nobel made over his discovery that nitroglycerin could be used to make dynamite. And he was selling dynamite to the Russians and to the United States for mines and railroads and tunnels. He made an awful lot of money, but he was a single man with no children. He had a few girlfriends, but he, <laughs> typical Albanian, I guess. But he decided when he died that he would give it all away to create the Nobel Foundation, which was a new concept. And he gave $9 million to create this foundation in Stockholm. He had been educated in Russia and in Paris. He had a home in Italy. Uh, but he decided to give it all away. 
he gave his family a little bit, he gave his business partners a little bit, but the majority of it went to create the foundation, and that created the Nobel Prizes. He died in 1896, and the prizes were started in 1901. It took five years to create the foundation, the committees, all described in his handwritten will as to how this money should be used. Pretty remarkable. He decided there would be prizes in medicine, physiology, chemistry, physics, literature, peace. And then in 1967, the Swedish bank gave a bunch of money to the foundation to create a prize for economics. So the original Nobel War award to the foundation created five Nobel Prizes. And then along came the sixth award, which is not a Nobel Prize, but it's a prize managed by the Nobel Foundation in economics. Uh, and Pavlov got the prize in 1904. Well, there have since been about 750 Nobel laureates all over the world, many of them in the U.S. because of the concentration of science in the United States. And today there are probably about 160 or 70 who are still living. And I probably know about half of them, many of them good friends, because we all go to the same places and meetings. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun to get to know these very bright people. But I thought I would pursue this new field of cyclic guanosine manifesting to see if it participated in cell signaling. This cartoon shows you three populations of cells that talk to each other. <coughs> I will call cell type 1 a neuronal cell. It could be in a brain or a peripheral nerve. Cell type 2 is an endothelial cell lining the wall of a blood vessel. And cell type 3 is a smooth muscle cell in the wall of the blood vessel. Cell type 1 wants to talk to cell type 2. And it does this by producing substances that Earl Sutherland called first messengers. Not a very popular term. We refer to them today as the whole group as ligands often. But we call them hormones, we call them growth factors, we call them cytokines. We give neurotransmitters, we give them a lot of different names. And some are small molecules, some are very big molecules. But they're released into the bloodstream and they want to find their target. They home in the body to find their target. They recognize their target as a cell with a protein in the membrane of that cell that we call a receptor. When these ligands are 